So continuing this conversation about pesticides and uh, environmental justice, um, all you need to do is think about the organic food market. Um, one could argue that everyone would like to eat organic food. Uh, everyone would benefit from organic food. If we know that pesticides and herbicides um, are harmful to our, uh, our bodies, then uh, eating food that does not have those in it would benefit everyone. But this is one of those places where um, wealth and position are going to give you a better opportunity to consume food that's actually organic. Um, uh, this, uh, uh, the organic food movement, uh, at least initially, has been seen as a vanity food or a, um, a positional good. So uh, uh, poor people usually don't have the discretionary funds to uh, choose a, a higher uh, priced banana, for example. Um, uh, if the banana is too expensive, the organic if the organic banana is too expensive, a uh, poor person's not going to be able to buy it. So um, uh, the way that we can choose whether we want uh, organic food or not uh, is usually um, that choice is usually given to those that are already in an advantaged social position. And, and so, of course, the results are some people are better able to avoid the effects of pesticides and food supplies than others. And um, that's really determined by whether you're wealthy or you're not wealthy in our society. Um, uh, we also have to take in consideration the other inequalities in, in pesticide exposure, uh, vulnerability among children, uh, of course, pregnant and nursing women are more affected uh, by pesticide exposure. Um, we know that these pesticides can disrupt the body's development, uh, whether it's the fetus or um, uh, the mother. Um, the more uh, we are exposed to pesticides, uh, the more we eat her body weight and uh, children can also be exposed to these toxins in breast milk. Um, uh, it, I'm not sure if I assign the story of stuff in this particular uh, class, but uh, Annie Leonard talks about uh, the, uh, the simple fact that uh, some of the most toxic food consumed by uh, newborns is their mother's breast milk and that's because their mother has been exposed to uh, toxins whether they are coming from the food chain or um, possibly the cosmetic or body products that their that their mother uses um, uh, which is uh, there's a, a, a video in this particular section on uh, the impacts of the toxins in cosmetics. Um, the chapter then goes into two important concepts, at least how we uh, want to think about the world and how we make decisions about the world. Uh, in this section, you're seeing a comparison between utilitarianism and um, uh, egalitarianism. And so uh, utilitarianism is the view that if something is for the greater good, it must be okay. Uh, Jeremy Bentham uh, said that it's the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of uh, what should be considered right or wrong. And, and, you know, there's a real problem with this way of thinking, you could say, well, hey, you know, 51% of the population is better off, um, and uh, and therefore the society as a whole is better off. But you know, that does not take into consideration the 49% that are not better off. Um, uh, the problem with utilitarianism 
in this form is that it, it tolerates a lot of inequality, especially in the distribution of the good. Uh, so as long as the majority is doing better, then, uh, then we're good. Uh, John Rawls, he of course does not uh, buy into Bentham's utilitarianism, and he's searching for something more uh, seen as a justice of fairness or a justice of equity. And so for Rawls, justice would mean that we would want the greatest good for everyone, not just for uh, uh, the 51%, but we would want to make sure that the 49% are taken care of as well. Uh, our own good must be realized within the context of others similarly and justly pursuing their own good. And, and so if we start to think of uh, constructing a world that you're just as my, you're just as likely to uh, be exposed to the environmental goods and bads as the next person, then you're going to structure that world in a different way. Versus if you're part of the 51% that uh, uh, benefits from a particular change in, in policy, um, then you don't have to worry about being impacted so uh, you would you would create policies uh, differently than you would if everything was based on fairness uh, this is a form of egalitarianism as I indicated uh, earlier and it's about maximizing fairness uh, Rawls went on to say that all social values liberty and opportunity income and wealth and bases of self-respect are to be distributed equally unless an unequal distribution of any or all of these values is to everyone's advantage. So as you can see, power is distributed and, and the social good is distributed in a much different way when you're talking about Rawls's egalitarianism than it is when you're talking about um, uh, Bentham's utilitarianism. And honestly, I have to say that I'm uh, more comfortable with uh, the world that John Rawls describes um, than I am with Bentham's utilitarianism. Um, we then move into uh, the ju to justice and the problem of pluralism. Or pluralism. Um, so what we're really trying to understand is how to incorporate social difference into political theory and into um, the distribution of the social good. So when we're thinking about this uh, this quandary, um, what uh, what we're seeing come out here is some new theorist taking Rawls's theory and and tweaking it a bit to uh, accommodate some more um, particular characteristics of pluralistic societies, and and what uh, Sin is is real Amatra Sin is focusing in on is that um, you know some people may or may not want to. Uh, be seen as equal within this society. And, and he assumes that, uh, that Rawls is, uh, is assuming that they would. Um, but if you read Rawls closely, his theory does not necessarily lead to any of the bizarre outcomes that uh, Sin lays out. Uh, but nevertheless, Sin wants to make the pluralism of people's needs and wants more explicit. So he suggests that we think of people as having functionings or beings and doings they have a reason to value in the language of said, right? Um, and in and capabilities uh, or freedoms for attaining these beings and doings. So for sin, 
justice is maximizing people's capabilities to achieve their functionings. So, once again, Sin's talking about maximizing people's capabilities to achieve their functionings. And in this new system, or this uh, system that is uh, standing on the shoulders of uh, Rawls's um, uh, egalitarianism, he talks of a lack of justice, which means people do not have uh, the capabilities of maximizing their functionings. Um, so if we think about uh, poverty, for example, the way that sin would describe poverty is uh, the capability deprivation of one's uh, uh, options to make it in society right, to have enough money to not be considered in the, um, uh, the realm of, of the poor. And, and he wants us to realize uh, that those capabilities depend on much more than money. Um, they, they also depend on poor health. Um, uh, not enough opportunity within your family, um, uh, housing locations, and, and things like that. Dworkin is also working off of uh, Rawls's uh, egalitarianism, and um, he wants us to realize that justice must be based on the recognition that we are all different. This is really speaking um, in, in the same perspective that uh, uh, Amatra Sin is coming from. Um, but Dworkin wants us to realize that uh, across the difference we need uh, uh, to understand an equality of concern or a responsibility of concern for others and what they individually value, but also uh, we have the responsibility for ourselves and what we individually value as well.